Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross MD tonight, uh, coming to you from um, Austin, Texas, where it's actually about 40 degrees today. <laughs> it's been a little bit cold here. I was hoping for warmer weather uh, being down here in Texas, but anyhow, that's what it is. I'm sorry I'm running a little bit late tonight, um, but we're gonna spend about an hour and 15 minutes together tonight. I'm not gonna be able to do the whole hour and a half, but about an hour and 15 minutes tonight. Um, so this is a, a webinar about Lyme disease, as many of you know, and uh, you create it with your questions. Each week you ask questions and I try to answer the questions to the best of my ability. Uh, during the webinar, I will be doing some screen shares where I'll show you information on my uh, Lyme disease information website uh, called Treat Lyme by Marty Ross MD. Um, I also probably show you some um, screenshots from um, my uh, my supplement store to give you ideas on some of the supplements that I um, like to work with in terms of the quality of those supplements too, if we get into questions about uh, supplements this evening as well too. Um, I am creating a recording of the webinar sometime tomorrow morning. I keep on trying to say I'm gonna have this ready by around uh, 8.30 or nine, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, but sometime earlier tomorrow morning, uh, Central Standard Time, I bet by around 9, 9.30, maybe even 10 o'clock Central Standard Time, I'll be getting uh, an email out to you, uh, notifying you that the recording is ready. Uh, if you happen to not get that email, you can find the recording on the front page of treatlime.net. You can also find it uh, towards the bottom of the homepage of my supplement store, Marty Ross MD Supplements, and that's at treatlime.com, okay? And you can find it on the supplements page. And then finally, um, you can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, I also always post these on my uh, Facebook page, which is treatlime, I'm sorry, is uh, facebook.com backslash treatlime, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. I see a number of uh, familiar uh, names uh, in terms of uh, people that are showing up on my attendance boards and I see some new people here tonight too. Uh, to all of you uh, that have been here before, welcome back and to the new people. Um, I hope uh, I hope you get some useful information out of tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started here. All right, so, oh, one other thing. So I will read the questions out loud, even though during the live webinar, you all can see those questions in the recorded version, it often doesn't show up. So <laughs> you get to hear me read them, okay? So this first one is from Colleen. Hi, Dr. Ross. You once mentioned a patient who can tolerate herbal antibiotics, so she divided the doses by mixing with water and taking a fraction of a drop. Could you share more details about that? Did she remain on that tiny of a dose and see improvements or did she eventually increase her dosage? And if so, how much did she eventually get up to? Um, how did she improve? Thank you so much for all you do to help us. All right, so it's, it's an interesting question. So the, page, the one patient I was talking about um, is a person I managed um, um, that had Lyme up in Canada. And um, she's extremely, extremely medicine sensitive. That wasn't just to the herbal antibiotics, that was to a large number of things that we would do. So one thing I, I wonder about sometimes when people are very medicine sensitive is that they might have some detox issues. Okay, so we did a number of things to help with detox. But keep in mind, if, you're, if, if a person has a hard time detoxing, that means that they have a hard time getting, uh, cleaning out the medicine you put in, okay? So with herbal antibiotics or with prescription antibiotics, what matters is, is there enough in the bloodstream, a level of those chemicals in the bloodstream that's enough to kill the germs, okay? And if you're having, if your ability to clean out the antibiotic, if your detox mechanisms that clean the antibiotic out of you are impaired, you probably don't need to put as much in, all right? Because if you're not cleaning it out so fast, then you don't need to put as much in to maintain that drug level, all right? So there's some people I try to be very, that when I was practicing, I was very careful about um, um, trying to make sure that they, or they were trying to get to the recommended doses I had for a number of my herbal antibiotic recommendations of 30 drops twice a day. And they were getting very frustrated because they couldn't get there. But and yeah, I think for most people that have healthy detox systems that can handle it, that's a good goal. But the real goal is, are you getting better, okay? And do you have enough of, the herbal drug or the prescription drug in you to actually kill the germ, all right? Second thing you have to consider is that in some people, uh, the ongoing Herxheimer reactions that get caused by killing the germ can be too much to handle too. So sometimes we have to use smaller amounts because 
the ability to deal with the Herxheimer reaction aspect may be complicated as well too. So this person that I was managing had her on um, a mixture of, I believe it was Houtania and Siddha Akuda for Bartonella and Otoba and Cat's Claw, which as many of you know, those are the herbs that I sometimes recommend for the lime germ. Okay, so lime germ would be Otoba and Cat's Claw, uh, Houtania and Siddha Akuda for Bartonella. Generally, with both of all those herbs, I try to work up on each of them to 30 drops twice a day. In her situation, we had, I think we had to start at almost a quarter drop uh, of each one time a day. I mean, it was, she was just so extremely sensitive, I just started slow. And in the end, I think the most we ever got up to with her was two drops of each of those twice a day. And she got a lot better. Um, she didn't get 100% well, she got maybe 70 to 80% back but compared to where she was initially, those were good improvements, okay? All right, so how do you do a quarter drop of, a, of, a, of an herb, all right? Because as you know, the Otoba and the Siddha and the Hutania and the Cat's Claw all come in these liquid eyedropper bottles, right? So the way that you wind up doing that is you take a full drop and you put it into, let's say four ounces of water. So you measure out four ounces of water. So a small juice glass, measure out four ounces, put that in and then put your one drop in there, all right? And then to get one quarter drop, you take one ounce out of that four ounces of water, all right? So you divide that four ounces into four parts. Each of those has a quip, the equivalent of a quarter drop of the medicine, all right? And so it took her about two years to get well, which is an average time frame I see with most people, even when you're able to use the uh, high dose prescription antibiotics or the higher dose herbal antibiotics. All right. So anyhow, I hope that gives you some insight. Um, you've got to go to a dose you can handle. Okay. But uh, the one thing I would say again, don't, uh, sometimes we get too caught up on getting to a dose, but especially in people that have detox problems, keep in mind, you probably don't need to take as much because you can't clean it out as fast. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Colleen. Thank you for that question. Hello, Megan. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Thank you again for all you do. You're welcome. Let's see. In your antibiotic protocol for Bartonella, does it matter if we get the brand name Bactrim or is the generic um, sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim? That's what the generic is sufficient. The answer is the generic's fine. And in fact, it's almost impossible to get the name brand Bactrim. Bactrim um, is a, a, a brand antibiotic that has two drugs in it. The drugs are called sulfamethoxazole and the other one is trimethoprim. And the majority of the time, it's one of the oldest antibiotics out there. It's an old sulfa antibiotic. And um, it generally, you can find it as, a, as the generic. The generic works fine. I never found problems with that when I was treating people with it. Uh, number two, if I'm taking Bactrim, should I avoid folate supplementation? You know, that, that's an interesting question because um, Bactrim can actually, uh, the sulfa, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna remember, I may not remember this correctly. One of the components, I think, it, I think it's the sulfa component in, in the um, Bactrim, the sulfa methoxazole, uh, interferes with folate metabolism, okay? Um, but um, taking folate uh, does not interfere with how the drug works, all right? So it may interfere with how your body uses folate, but taking folate is not gonna interfere with how uh, the Bactrim or the, the components of Bactrim works, all right? All right, number three, if one is on antibiotics for Bartonella for say 2.5 months and almost all symptoms are gone, do you suggest going off antibiotics abruptly and see if the symptoms rebound as a way to test if you're done? Um, for example, is the bark clear before the typical four to six month time frame? And what if the six month time frame you still have symptoms, should you stay on the antibiotics longer? All right, so, um, it gets to be tricky to figure out sometimes with uh, Bartonella if you're done, because sometimes some of those symptoms that we attribute to Bartonella are actually Lyme symptoms, okay? So one symptom that Lyme and Bartonella can hold in common is difficulty thinking. Uh, another one might be some of the neuropathies that people get. So the loss of feeling or the nerves not helping the muscles to work correctly, all right? Um, so I, when I was treating people, I wanted to make sure that I had a general sense of whether most of those Bartonella symptoms were gone or markedly down before I would stop. 
All right. It was just more of a general sense I would have. I can't give you a hard, fast rule on that. All right. What I would tell you, though, is in chronic Lyme, most of the time I found I had to treat people for at least four months and that if symptoms were persisting, I would go up to about six months. The idea you have of stopping at 2.5 months, I found to be a risky proposition in my practice. And the reason is, and, and I think you've heard me, you may have heard me describe this on some of my webinars or the recordings of my webinars, or I may even, I think I describe it in my articles about how to treat Bartonella. The issue with Bartonella is that it replicates fairly quickly, okay? And so um, each germ is thought to create babies every 24 hours. And so if you stop um, a Bartonella treatment in the middle before you're done, there is the possibility the germ will come back really quickly. All right. So for that reason, I would shoot usually for at least a minimum of four months, but I would get a general sense of what was going on with most of the Bartonella symptoms and decide if we're done. So I can't give you a hard, fast rule on that. Okay. Uh, all right. Number four, let's see. If one has spinal pain in both bone and muscle surrounding the spine, does that mean the Bartonella infection is too deep to get rid of? Um, my sense is no. Um, um, again, as, as you know, I write about in my articles about treating Bartonella, or maybe you don't know this, um, I found that when you used antibiotic regimens that involve two agents that work inside of cells, or those are called intracellular antibiotics. So you designed your Bartonella treatment, so it included at least two antibiotics or two herbs. But on the two antibiotic side, I found that um, you could eventually find two antibiotics that would work to eradicate Bartonella at least 95% of the time. Okay. Now, I will say on the Hutania Siddha Akuta, those are the two herbs that can sometimes work too. They tend to work, my clinical experience suggests that they only work about 70, 75% of the time, which is good. I mean, especially if that's all you can get and that's all you can tolerate. All right. But not quite as good as the prescription antibiotics. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think that the muscle pain and the spine pain is a suggestion that they're too deep to get at. That would be my, that would be my sense of it. Okay. All right. I'm going to do a quick screen share here because I've mentioned Bartonella article a couple times here. And I just want to show you guys where you can find it here. Just a minute. All right. So we're going to do a screen share. So uh, if you're here, you all know about my website um, called Treat Lime uh, by Marty Ross, MD. And this is it. And um, so if you're looking at my ideas on how to treat any infection, because uh, there's slightly different ways to treat, the, de depending on which infection you have, what, how you treat it, okay, would be to take a look at my section called infection treatment plans here on my online Lyme guide. And pretty much I have an, an idea on uh, how to treat most of the germs you might see and what we call Lyme disease, all right? So for Bartonella, here's the article I've written. It's called Kills Bartonella Brief Guide. Um, I give you various approaches, but most of them are built on using two intracellular antibiotics at the same time, okay? Now, if you're a person that doesn't necessarily like to read things online, uh, you could order uh, my book, uh, which is called Anti-Germ Action Plans for Lyme Disease. Essentially, I took most of the articles that you see in the online guide on my infection treatment plan section, and I have cleaned them up, edited them, made them a little easier to read, and put them in this book called Anti-Germ Action Plans, all right? And you can even, if you want to have this now, you can get a downloadable PDF version of it, for instance, where you pay and you get it right away, all right? You can also find out on Kindle, you can get a, a paperback version of it as well, too. All right, and I put that together because I know a number of people were having a hard time just reading things online. So there's one, one way to get all this information, okay? Um, yeah, all right, let me go back here. All right, thank you for that question, good luck. All right, next question is from Jeffrey, let's see here. Hi, Jeffrey. Let's see. What is the best antibiotic to get rid of eye floaters? And could eye floaters be parasites? As some of mine look like, uh, like see-through worms. Is it parasites? Can you name the species? I should get tested for. Is it becoming a lot worse? Thanks. So um, floaters, uh, so you can get floaters um, are basically made up of uh, debris, I guess I would call that, in the eye, sometimes dead blood cells. There might be a possibility at spirochetes. I, I think it would be extremely hard to see spirochetes, but I don't. I haven't seen anyone actually define what floaters are, science that defines 
what the actual floaters are that people with Lyme see, okay? In my experience treating Lyme, I found that as I treated Lyme with whatever approach I was using, that as a person started to recover, the floaters would get better, all right? So it could be herbal or prescription antibiotics. In my clinical experience when I was treating Lyme, I did not see any one antibiotic work better at helping to get rid of those floaters than another. Nor did I do anything specifically to treat parasites uh, as a means of getting rid of those floaters. I, and I kind of, I just don't think that they're parasites actually. Okay. All right. Good question though, Jeffrey. Good luck to you. Hello, Fiona. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you for doing these sessions. They're so helpful. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. I have had Lyme for two and a half years and just started triple antibiotics in January. Since November, I've uh, been doing high dose vitamin C IVs, which have helped energy uh, when spaced too far apart energy crashes, plus multiple supplements. Could you please comment on the safety and effectiveness of ultraviolet B, C light combined with ozone blood treatment? My Lyme LLMD has recommended that I do a few monthly treatments for antibacterial purposes. Can you compare the absorption rates of glutathione, liposomal versus uh, nebulizer, which is preferable, must absorb? Would a 400 milligram dose of lipoglutathione be equivalent to the same dose in a nebulizer? Okay, so let, let me talk about um, what is called oxidizing agents or oxidation medicine first, okay? And then I'll answer the second part about your glutathione. So oxidation medicine are agents that um, oxidize. Um, oxidize basically uses oxygen and oxygen-like chemicals uh, in our body. So for instance, our immune system, when white blood cells see a germ, they will get close. One of the things they can do to treat infections is get close to the germ and actually release um, um, hydrogen peroxide and I believe some ozone they can release onto the germ too. They spit it out at it basically. And that can kill the germ, all right? So oxidizing agents, one of the ways that they can work if they're in close proximity to the germ, if they're right next to the germ, oxidizing agents can kill a germ. And the way they do that is they damage the fat membrane of the germ and they may uh, actually damage the DNA, the genetic material of the germ, okay? Now keep in mind, germs don't have antioxidants. We as humans have antioxidants, okay? Now what's interesting, so, so in theory, it would look great. It looks like these oxidizing agents, whether it's high dose vitamin C, 25 grams, that's high dose vitamin C, actually becomes an oxidizing agent, okay? So vitamin C we think of as an antioxidant, but at that dose, it functions as an oxidizing agent, okay? And um, other oxidizing agents would be UV uh, uh, treatments like you're mentioning, um, Ozone uh, treatments, hydrogen peroxide treatments uh, can be oxidizing agents too, all right? Now, there are many physicians out there that claim that they're probably killing germs. I myself am doubtful. I think there's another effect that they may have. And the reason I'm doubtful is one of the uh, researchers that's done a lot of work looking at oxidation medicine uh, conducted some test tube experiments. And what he did in these test tube experiments is he had bacteria and then he would mix it with just a little bit of blood serum, the liquid part of blood and ozone. And what he found, I believe in the experiments, is that if he just used germs and ozone, he could kill the germs, all right? But if he mixed, I think it was 10% of the liquid volume was the plasma or the liquid part of a patient's blood mixed in with these bacteria, and then they would introduce the ozone, they found no killing at all. Okay, now, why is that? Well, the reason is our blood is full of antioxidants, okay? So the, the issue is that, yeah, on, on a Petri dish and some of these test tube experiments, it looks great, ozone, UVB, which oxidizes blood, all these things that can do oxidizing look great on a test tube. I don't think they really work in us to kill germs though. I don't think that's how they work because if you, because there's all this blood in, in us is full of antioxidants, it's protecting us from the damage of oxidizing agents, okay? So let me give you another idea. So in anti-aging medicine, one of the biggest things that's used are ox antioxidants. They tell us to take antioxidants to prevent the effects of aging. And what that's doing is it's preventing, is fixing, trying to keep these oxidizing agents from damaging our cell membranes, okay? All right, 
Now, if you look at studies about oxidizing agents, though, there is one benefit that they have. They actually lead to higher oxygen levels within our cells. And if you get more oxygen in inside of a cell, that can help the energy factories in the cells called mitochondria work better, okay? So people, when they do get, they feel better after ozone treatments or they feel better after UVB treatments or high dose vitamin C, it may be that it's because of the oxygenation, the improved oxygen delivery to the energy factories called mitochondria in our cells. They, they may be able to work better and produce more energy, all right? Now, the concern I have is that I know a number of my colleagues are using ultraviolet and uh, ozone treatments, et cetera, for ongoing long-term treatment, all right? The ish concern I have, we have no long-term studies that say with repeated use of oxidizing agents, might we be harming the cell membranes or our own genetic material, all right? Remember, these are oxidizing agents. Even though our blood is full of antioxidants, maybe at a point we overcome that, all right? So I have a safety concern about using these long-term. I do think on a short-term basis, I'm okay with people. And when I had patients I was treating, I was okay with them getting them on short-term basis. I wasn't doing it in my practice, but they would see other people that would do that. And I'm talking maybe four to eight treatments, but I don't think we have long-term safety information. And again, the test tube experiments would suggest just a little it makes it so they can't kill germs. I don't think you're getting killing effects here, okay? All right, so I have a whole article about ozone. I'll show it to you and I, 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 where I cite the science. I'll give you the references on the science there too. I'll show you that in just a minute, all right? Okay, now when it comes to glutathione, here's one of the problems with glutathione. Glutathione is the very powerful antioxidant, okay? It's made in every one of our cells and it's used by cells to fix damage, all right? Uh, the other thing is it's made in high concentrations uh, within our, uh, within the liver and it's used as the main um, uh, detox agent uh, that the liver uses to detox chemicals out. Um, it's really useful in the nerve and brain tissues to help repair damage as well too, okay? And because it's a, an um, antioxidant, it's very effective at lowering oxidizing agents that are triggering your uh, white blood cells to make cytokines. So it's another way that we can lower inflammation cytokines in the body as well. So I love glutathione for many reasons, okay? I have a whole article about benefits of glutathione too, and I'll show you that in a second as well too. But the problem with glutathione is getting it absorbed, getting it into us, okay? And that's because if we take it orally and it's not specially prepared, it will get destroyed by the acid in the stomach. And so there are ways that we can minimize that. And one way is to do something called liposomal glutathione. Liposomal glutathione is glutathione that's microscopically wrapped in fat, okay? And so, for instance, one of the products out there is a product by Research Nutritionals called TriFortify Orange, TriFortify Watermelon. Research Nutritionals has done some studies looking at what happens with red blood cell levels of glutathione uh, in somebody taking their products. And what they found is that actually you do get significant elevations of glutathione in the red blood cells. That suggests that you get good absorption of liposomal glutathione out of the gut, okay? So if you're gonna do an oral version, I think liposomal is the best way to go. Research Nutritionals has got some science suggesting that they get pretty good absorption, all right? All right, but the strongest way to make sure you get glutathione in you would be IV because that gets it right into the bloodstream. That can be expensive though, all right? Another option is to do what's called nebulized glutathione. And that is you breathe a mist of the glutathione and you use a machine called a nebulizer. It's like this, about this big. It has, a, it's an air compressor basically. It blows air out through a small tube that connects to a small chamber and you dump your glutathione liquid in there. It has a mouthpiece on it. You just breathe this, the, the mist that comes off, all right? And that gets it deep into your lungs. And then once it gets in the lungs, it's absorbed into the bloodstream. So it's another way of getting it kind of more quickly into the bloodstream, all right? So that's probably the second strongest way of getting a glutathione in. And then the third strongest way would be the oral glutathione. I have never seen any studies that tell us what an equivalent dose is of oral liposomal glutathione versus nebulized glutathione. I honestly don't know, okay? What I can tell you is what I saw clinically work in my practice, and that is I found benefit using five milliliters of uh, liposomal glutathione, which I believe is about 500 milligrams of glutathione, okay? Or 
I would have people do 400 milligram uh, nebulized treatments of glutathione twice a day. Or if I was to do IV glutathione, I'd go really high. I would dose that at about, um, oh boy, I'm going to blank. I, I have it in my article. I'll, I'll show you the article here in a second so you can take a look at it. But usually when you do IV glutathione, you only need to do it once or twice a week. Okay. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and show you both of those articles that I was telling you about. So I'm going to show you the one on glutathione. Oh, and then on ozone too. All right. Let me show you here. Okay. So let's see here. I'm going to look at, I'm just going to type in ozone. So here's the article I have on ozone. It's called Ozone, Hydrogen Peroxide, Vitamin C, UV Blood Irradiation in Lyme. Okay. And I give you a little bit more detail about what I just described, but essentially it's um, what I just described there. All right. And yeah. So anyhow, a bunch of references I have about that too. And I believe that uh, that little, what I just explained to you, I'll turn into a video clip for this article. I <laughs> see I don't have one there. So anyhow, I would take a look at that. This is a relatively new article. I think I wrote it about a month or two months ago. Okay, all right. And then in terms of glutathione, the article I have on glutathione is called Glutathione, the Great Fixer, okay? And here it is. And I talk about all the things that can help with liver detoxification, Herxheimer reactions, nerve and brain repair, liver repair. And I talk about the different ways you can take it, either liposomal, you can do the, the building blocks called glutathione precursors, glutathione by nebulizer, and glutathione IV. And the dosage range I was using in my practice was anywhere from 1,200 to 2,500 milligrams two times a week, okay? And there's a bunch of references down here as well, too. So this might be a useful article for you to take a look at, too. All right. All right. Thanks for that question, Fiona. Good luck to you. Hello, Mia. Hi, doctor. I recently had an ulcer found via cystoscopy on my bladder after suffering with bladder pain for six months now. My gynecologist says interest was cystitis, but when my urologist saw the images, he said it looks like a bacteria. When I told him he had Lyme Bartonella, he said this makes more sense. On top of the found ulcer, I had been experiencing rotating bladder pain all over my bladder pelvis for months now. That has previously gotten worse. Urine blood tests for any potential non-related to Lyme issues have been clear. What are your thoughts? So, so interstitial cystitis uh, is means inflammation of the lining of the bladder, okay? And we do see in Lyme disease when people have, there seems to be, at least in my clinical experience, and I know from talking with my colleagues, that we tend to see this a little bit more often in people with Lyme. The two germs that we think may be involved are Lyme and or Lyme and Bartonella, okay? So as you suggest, that doesn't surprise me that you have Lyme and Bartonella. Those tend to be when interstitial cystitis um, appears in somebody with Lyme, I tend to think of Lyme and I tend to think of Bartonella as the cause of that, okay? So symptoms of interstitial cystitis can be a lot of uh, sometimes burning on urination, sometimes a lot of bladder just achiness, for instance. Sometimes people will have blood in their urine that shows up from it. Now, I haven't seen it described before that people get ulcers like you're describing, but it's possible. I mean, I, I don't know why it would not be possible, okay? So when I had somebody uh, with Lyme disease that had interstitial cystitis, uh, or even if they didn't have it, even if they didn't have Lyme or Bartonella causing it, uh, the treatments that I have found helpful in my practice based on some science and also just based upon what I saw at work um, would be two things. Number one, if you have Lyme and Bartonella, treat those infections, okay? So uh, using your or, or herbal or prescription uh, antimicrobial regimens, all right? The other thing that can be helpful is to do a mix of um, a two herbs uh, for in the blad or that, that can work in the bladder. One is quercetin and the other one is glucosamine sulfate, okay? So 
Glucosamine sulfate, you may be thinking of why. So glucosamine sulfate is commonly used for people with joint pains, okay? Because it's used as a building block for cartilage, all right? But in the bladder, it's actually converted in, um, has the possibility of being turned into a microscopic gelatinous coat, okay? So it may help protect the lining of the bladder, all right? Because what happens is when this bladder lining gets all inflamed, and then the urine, which is more acidic, meets it. That kind of keeps some of that um, uh, inflammation going. So if you can protect the lining of the bladder by microscopically coating it, which is one of the things that glucosamine sulfate may do because it can be converted into that, okay? That gives you a protective layer, all right? The second thing you do is quercetin um, is a chemical that's found in the skin of colorful fruits and vegetables. Many of you may be aware of it because we use it for allergies because it can stabilize uh, cells called mast cells that make histamines. But also quercetin um, is, um, um, is a good anti-cytokine agent too. It can decrease inflammation. And for some reason, it seems to concentrate well enough within the bladder lining, okay? So because it decreases inflammation, it may also help decrease the inflammation in the bladder lining as well, okay? So you could either do 500 milligrams three times a day of quercetin along with 500 milligrams three times a day of glucosamine. Those are doses I found helpful in my practice, okay? Or there is a compound called Bladder Ease, um, which is sold by a company called uh, Vitanica. Um, I, have, I have the product at Marty Ross MD Supplements. And that product, although it's never been researched to show that it actually helps with uh, interstitial cystitis, what it has in it are the things that help with inter that may help with interstitial cystitis based on the function of those herbs. Okay, so it has glucosamine in it, and it has quercetin in it. Okay, um, and if you were to do that, the dosing I found successful on that, or that I found helpful in my practice, was to do uh, the bladder ease uh, four pills three times a day. Okay, so that's a lot of, you're going to be doing a lot of pills either way. But I, I would usually suggest that people try that for a couple months. And if it is going to be a benefit for you, you should see benefit within that time frame. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I, I think it makes sense that these are the Lyme and Bartonella can lead uh, to interstitial cystitis. I've seen that happen in my practice. And many of us that treat Lyme see that uh, quite often, actually. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Mia. Good luck to you. Mia, um, the other thing is your doctors have probably talked with you about um, certain foods that uh, tend to do better with interstitial cystitis too, okay? Um, and, and so I, I agree with diet recommendations that can help with that as well, okay. Hello, Lynn, let's see, hold on here a minute. Okay, questions. Question about doxycycline. Are magnesium supplements like Calm okay with doxycycline? Uh, does food reduce absorption of doxycycline as opposed to empty stomach? Are delayed release tablets more effective than capsules? Is doxy less of a microbiome disruptor than antibiotics? Um, is it true that doxy is not bacterial cytal unless given at high doses and the 200 milligram per day is only bacteriostatic static and completely useless for Lyme? Would you recommend doxy for Lyme carditis, AB block, or could you choose another antibody? Thank you. All right. So doxycycline um, is an antibiotic that gets inside of cells. Okay. So we call it an intracellular antibiotic. And as an intracellular antibiotic, it's useful at helping treat uh, spirochete Lyme. That's the corkscrew looking form. It's useful at treating Lyme that lives inside of cells because this is an antibiotic that works inside the cells. Okay. And, um, it's, um, so, the, so it, it's useful for those two purposes, okay? So intracellular Lyme um, and also getting at um, spirochetes, okay? Whether the spirochetes are in or out of the cells, all right? Now, doxycycline is known as what's called a bacteriostatic antibiotic, okay? Uh, so bacteriostatic antibiotics are antibiotics that uh, work by basically slowing the growth or blocking the growth of the germ so eventually the germ dies or the immune system goes and gets it because it's not growing anymore, all right? 
Other uh, bacteria um, static antibiotics would be the macrolides, for instance, and those would be things like Zithromax and Clarithromycin, which is biaxin. Okay, those are bacteriostatic too. Now, bacteriostatic still kills Lyme. Okay, but it may be true uh, for some people, maybe a bactericidal antibiotic will work better. Okay, so bactericidal would be things like amoxicillin, cefuroxime. Those are bactericidal. Okay. Um, so they kill the germ outright. They don't interfere with the growth of the germ. All right. Now in Lyme, both sets of antibiotics uh, can be helpful. And in fact, I've treated people with just doxycycline alone and then put them on grapefruit seed extract to treat the cyst. And that's all I needed to do. Never put them on a bactericidal antibiotic as you're suggesting. Okay. It is true though, that, um, there is, there is some belief with limited science that says that at higher doses, as you're suggesting, uh, doxycycline may uh, be bactericidal. Now, is one way better than the other? I don't know. They both work to get rid of the germ. They just have different mechanism by which they work, okay? Right. Now, magnesium is okay to take with doxycycline. However, I don't know what's in the calm. If the calm has calcium in it, that's going to decrease absorption of your doxycycline, okay? Magnesium can decrease absorption of azithromycin and clarithromycin. So that's when you want to uh, take magnesium separated by at least uh, probably a couple hours or so from those, those, okay? But magnesium by itself, if there's no calcium along that supplement, should be fine to take with your doxycycline. Does food reduce absorption of doxycycline? It can if it has calcium in it, okay? So doxycycline, if you're going to take it at higher doses, it's hard to take on an empty stomach, though. It gives a lot of nausea. So I suggested when I was practicing that people actually take their doxycycline uh, with, uh, with food, but not with dairy um, or calcium-containing products, okay? Um, in which case, you'd be okay, all right? So that's where the issue of calcium and food comes in. So you can take it with food, just don't want to have it with calcium. Let's see. Is doxy less of a microbiome disruptor than other antibiotics? Um, there's been no studies that I'm aware of that says one antibiotic is better, less uh, destructive than the gut microbiome than others. Um, I, I think it has as great of a chance of hurting the microbiome as an, any antibiotic can. Okay. Uh, let's see. And what I, what I find it helpful in a carditis uh, AV block, um, yeah, I, I did find it helpful in that kind of a situation. Um, my sense is I don't think it would be any more helpful or less helpful than anything else we might try. Okay? All right. Good luck to you, Lynn. Hello, Mark. Let's see. Hello, Doc Marty. Thank you for all you do for all of us. My wife has excess cytokines and mold toxins. Um, she had burning in her hands and shins for the last five years. And with her recent setback, now is spreading up her legs, up her arms, and is now all through her body. One of her doctors wants to put her on low-dose naltrexone to help with pain. I have read in your book that, it, that you have changed your mind about it. Does this sound like a good idea? Again, thank you for these weekly visits. Have a good break, and we shall look forward to late March. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so many of I, Mark, and uh, and I, 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 you haven't said your wife's name, so I won't use it here. But I know who you're talking about. So, um, in terms of so everyone, you may be aware, I'm not going to be here next week and the week after. The reason is um, my I'm meeting the rest of my siblings up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, to um, take apart my mom's home. Unfortunately, she's a uh, uh, recently had a stroke and has moved into a nursing home. So I don't know if I'm going to call it the best break, but I, I'm still looking forward to seeing my siblings up there. But that, that's why I'm not going to be available the next uh, week or two. I've got some family business to take care of. Um, looking forward to seeing my, my siblings and, and seeing my mom as well, too. But anyhow, um, so in terms of uh, the symptoms that um, that she's having, this uh, the burning in her hands and chin, spreading up the legs. That sounds like neurologic injury pain, okay? And a couple things, I, I suspect you're already doing it, but one thing that can be helpful to repair nerve injury is to be on um, glutathione, okay? And I, I think you guys are aware of that. 
the other thing that can sometimes be helpful is to be on some type of uh, phospholipids, um, fats that make up the cell covering, which would be like an NT factor. And I know you're aware of that or to get um, a phosphatidylcholine infusions. And I think if I remember right from your question last week, you've been doing some of those phosphatidylcholine infusions. Okay. All right. So I just want to, I don't want to forget those as things that might repair the injuries. All right. Um, naltrexone, actually, I'm, I'm a, I, I believe in naltrexone. So I'm not sure. I may have to go back and read what I wrote in my article, but I did update the article on naltrexone. Oh, I know what it was. My old version of the article was, was that I only found naltrexone helpful for people with Lyme maybe about 20% of the time. Um, uh, but there are certain situations where I do think it can be quite beneficial, okay? And one is in uh, nerve pain and muscle pain kind of syndromes. Uh, so naltrexone, everyone, is a narcotic blocker, okay? So we use it in medicine for people that have um, overdoses of narcotics, for instance, all right? It, it goes to a narcotic receptor and bumps off those narcotics, all right? Now, our bodies have a natural uh, narcotic system. They're called endorphins. Our system makes endorphins. And we make endorphins to regulate pain at those endorphin receptors, the same ones that naltrexone binds to, okay? But we also make endorphins to regulate the immune system, okay? All right. So these, so what you can do is you can take um, naltrexone in small doses, that's why we call it low dose naltrexone. It's actually manufactured as a 50 milligram pill. But if you take it in small doses, anywhere from like about 1.5 milligrams up to 4.5 milligrams, it will bind to those narcotic receptors in our body, the endorphin receptors, short term, like maybe four or six hours. And what happens during that time, under blockade, those receptors become more sensitive and the brain sends out a bunch of signals to the body and says, make more endorphins. So what happens when that blockade wears off at about four to six hours, those endorphin receptors get flooded with more endorphins and, and they're more sensitive to those endorphins too, okay? Now that can help your immune system do better, all right? So that can make it so that people whose Lyme has caused their immune system to start attacking the body, it can kind of decrease some of that, all right? Okay, so that's one reason to use naltrexone is it may regulate the immune system so it's less inflammatory. Um, and it's something I would usually suggest people might consider trying about six to nine months into treatment. And I found that helps about 20% of the time, okay? You need to give it about a six month trial, okay? But another reason to use naltrexone, which may be of more interest uh, to what's happening with your wife, is that it also binds to a group of um, endorphin receptors in the brain, uh, in an area of the brain called the amygdala, I believe. And when it binds there, it alters the brain's reaction to pain. It actually has a way of decreasing the brain sensitivity to pain, okay? Uh, and so for instance, that's a mechanism by which we think it can be helpful in fibromyalgia. And it may help with nerve pain as well too. So separate from its immune regulation capabilities, it may, it, by blocking endorphin receptors at the level of the brain, it's altering um, the nerve sensing and the nerve relaying of pain at the brain level, okay? All right, so you may wanna take a, go back and relook at that article. I'll show everyone here in a minute. But I mentioned those as two possible ways. And I could see where that might be something for her to try, okay? All right, so is it, um, I, I wish, I wish, I hope things start turning around here for her soon again. Um, and I keep, I'm sorry to keep hearing how things are going, but um, and it does sound like a reasonable thing to try, okay? All right, let me go, let me just do a quick screen share here. All right, so, if you're looking for my article on naltrexone, um, I think you can find it in the brain and nerves chapter. And I think you can also find it in the um, immune system chapter, or maybe I have it in the pain chapter. Yeah, I guess I didn't put it in the brain and nerves chapter, but um, you can find it in the immune chapter. I know about that. And I believe you can find it in the pain chapter. Let's just see if it's in the pain chapter here. Yeah, there it is. So this is the article, LDN for Lyme. Okay. 
and uh, take a look at this. Uh, it talks about the various ways that it could be helpful, including mostly immune regulation, but also, um, again, it may help um, affect, um, actually it might be something helpful in mast cell activation syndrome too. I forgot to mention that, uh, but also is useful in terms of pain. Okay, all right. All right, let me go back here. Take care, Mark, and take care to um, that person beside you there, okay? All right. Hello, Bill, let's see, hello, Dr. Ross. I've been treated um, over the last two years with multiple antibiotic protocols for Borrelia, Bartonella, and Mycoplasma based on a positive L-spot with clinical signs of migratory tendon and ligament inflammation, cardiac arrhythmias, memory loss, and brain fog, insomnia, nubbin dystrophy, um, dystrophy, and burning sensation in the feet and hands. All clinical signs improved and the L-spot test became negative. I have relapsed with all of the above clinical signs, however, not as severe and the L-spot is negative. With negative testing, we are not sure which germ to target and what protocol to use. Your thoughts? All right. So one thing I would say, um, so L-spot testing, everyone. L-spot is a method um, to see if your a type of white blood cell called a T cell um, has been exposed to Lyme, or if we're doing an L-spot test for Bartonella, Bartonella, or if we're doing an L-spot test for Babesia, Babesia. Uh, sometime within the last two months, okay? Uh, so T cells, once they um, have been exposed to something, live in us, or T cells circulate for two months and then they die, all right? So um, they, even if we kill off all of a germ, those T cells that saw that germ circulate for up to two months. So whenever a Ellis spot comes back positive, it means that probably sometime in the last two months that germ has been in you, okay? Now the problem with Ellis spot testing is it's not perfect. All right, so in medicine, we recognize something called sensitivity, which is what is the ability for that test to find something if it's in you, all right? And L-spot testing is generally recognized as about 85% sensitive, okay? That means it's going to miss a germ if it's in you 15% of the time, all right? So just the fact that the L-spot testing is negative does not mean that it's not your Lyme or your Bartonella or your mycoplasma that got active. All right, but, but I probably wouldn't even go there to begin with. All right, and here's why. The, what I found in my practice, and often whenever I had somebody that would have something that looked like a relapse after doing better, I would always wonder what else is going on in you that could be triggering excess inflammation from cytokines that looks just like Lyme, okay? Remember, Lyme disease, as I described throughout my website and I describe in these webinars, Lyme disease is a syndrome of too many cytokines. And it's these excess cytokines that give you the difficulty thinking, make you hurt all over, give you fatigue, uh, make your joints crack. I mean, all the symptoms that we say are Lyme symptoms, the majority of those are from your white blood cells reacting to the germ, producing too many cytokines, these inflammatory chemicals told too many cytokines, okay? And, and remember though, I mean, cytokines are good and bad. On the good side, the right amount, they actually help support your immune system. But in conditions where the immune system is having a hard time, it may keep trying harder and harder and eventually can make too many cytokines and then they can become part of the problem, okay? And excess cytokines also can suppress your immune system too, all right? So what else, what else could trigger too many cytokines that looks just like Lyme? too many yeast in the intestines, all right? So one of the things I would always do is to try to see before jumping the hoops and trying to say, is it a Lyme reactivation? Is it a Bartonella reactivation? Is it a mycoplasma? Is I would step back and say, hmm, I wonder if from being on all those antibiotics, did you get too many yeast in your intestines that are causing you problems, okay? And keep in mind, even though you may have been off antibiotics, I, I, this would even happen. People would see me sometimes a year after they were in remission. They'd come back suddenly worse a year later, okay? And they hadn't taken any antibiotics over that last year. 
but I saw enough going on in them that suggested yeast. I would treat yeast and within three weeks to four weeks, they're back to normal again. It can be that quick. Okay. Um, so why would you be a setup for yeast? Well, from being on the antibiotics, okay? It disturbs the good bacteria in your intestines enough that makes it easy for the yeast that also live in the intestines to grow too much. And that can, process can even happen six months, nine months, a year after treatment, sometimes even more, okay? And what I found in my practice when I was treating is if somebody was doing better and then they had something that looked like a relapse, usually about 80 to 90% of the time, it was actually yeast, okay? So how can you figure that out? Well. You, you know you're a risk because you're already on all those antibiotics, okay? So number one, is there a risk? Yeah, the answer is yes, okay. Secondly, have you had increased sugar cravings? Uh, third, is there any increased intestinal gassiness or bloating? Uh, in females, is there any vaginal itching, vaginal discharge, okay? Uh, do you get a lot worse after you have something that's simple sugars in it? Do you feel worse? Do you get a lot more bloated or does your energy just totally dive, okay? And then one of the more interesting symptoms of people that have too many yeast in their intestines, it often will lead to pimples and acne-like lesions on the face, or maybe the chest, or maybe even on the back too. And it's not that the yeast is actually growing in those pimples, it's that for some reason, uh, and there's been, there's science that shows this too, the toxins that get released from yeast uh, in the intestines get absorbed into, into the body and they can interact with the, the skin in a way that can lead it to be easier to get pimples or acne, okay? So if I found somebody had any one of those going on, uh, any one of those symptoms going on, I would treat for yeast first, okay? So that's something you may wanna consider looking at with your physician because again, 80 to 90% of the time, all right? And in fact, in some of my patients, if I could not, if I really wasn't certain, and yet they had been doing so well and then suddenly they did worse. Sometimes I would just empirically treat for yeast, even if they didn't have a lot of symptoms of it, meaning I would just do the one month yeast treatment of Nystatin and probiotics and Diflucan to see if they might get better, okay? Now keep in mind, if you treat yeast, it often is gonna be two to three weeks before you start seeing significant improvement, okay? And that is using a combination. I used to usually used to like to use a combination of Nystatin, Diflucan, and probiotics, all right? Now, I'm gonna show you information that gives you dosing information I found helpful and other information about that too, but let me do a screen share here for you. Okay, let's see here. So first, I'm just gonna to go to my yeast chapter, okay? So in the yeast chapter, take a look at this article called Kills Yeast, A Brief Guide. I walk you through the ways that I would approach it, okay? This article here, A Silent Problem, Do You Have Yeast, talks about how to diagnose yeast. Um, I would probably not do the questionnaire in here because if you've already been treated for Lyme, the questionnaire is not as useful. I would look at those questions that I just mentioned to you. And I have those questions in here, all right? And then take a look at this article, Steps to Fix a Lyme Treatment Crash. This is the article where I discuss that it probably is yeast causing the majority of what we call Lyme crashes. Okay, all right. Good luck to you, Bill. Um, I hope it is as simple as yeast for you. Okay, all right. Hello, Heather, let's see. How do you feel about naturopaths that do muscle testing to diagnose an illness and choose medications and supplements? Are there any other mole tests besides real-time labs that are affordable and accurate? Uh, what would you suggest to the person is living in a moldy environment, can't move? Thank you and enjoy your few weeks off. All right, um, Heather, um, <laughs> sorry. I talked about the enjoyment part of those few weeks off, but I will. I mean, it'll be good to see my family members. Um, not so sure I'm looking forward to the the, uh, the task at hand of breaking down my mom's home, but uh, you know, that's the type of life that I'm in right now and, and that she's in too, unfortunately. So yeah. All right, let's see. How do I feel about naturopaths and muscle testing? Well, okay, so muscle testing is a form of kinesiology, okay? It's energy. You're trying to determine energetically if either there's a diagnosis there or if certain medicines going to work right for you. All right. And, you know, in Seattle, Washington, where I practiced medicine until I moved here to Austin, there were a lot of people that did kinesiology. A lot of naturopaths did. 
And also there's a physician named Dietrich Klinghardt. Many of you probably have heard of Dietrich Klinghardt. Dietrich Klinghardt did an energy testing medicine, a method called ART testing, all right? He basically would bring a medicine into the person's energy field and feel for changes in their pulse to see if it, um, something called autonomic response testing to see if that was the right medicine for them. He would even use it as a means of diagnosis, all right? Now, Dietrich is the one that developed ART testing. My sense in, in the patients I saw that went to him and also from talking with people, I had a sense his, his ability to do his testing was pretty accurate, okay? But I don't think the majority of people he trained in his method are that good. I don't think they do, they're good testers, all right? There are other kinesiology methods too. And I think that there are some good, what I would call testers out there, but boy, it's such an art form. I generally don't think it's accurate for diagnoses. I think it may give some useful information when trying to determine uh, what to take if something that somebody has recommended to you is energetically going to be good for you. But generally, I'm kind of shy away from energetic testing unless it's a tester that I learned to trust. Okay. And in the Seattle area, there were a couple that I was uh, comfortable if they provided information. Uh, well, actually, a few. There was a few that I was comfortable. Uh, but the majority of people that I found that uh, Dietrich Klinghardt had, had trained, I, I just don't think were good testers. I don't think they were getting adequate results. All right. Um, so the testing, kinesiology, is only as good as the person doing it. All right. Uh, are there any other bull tests besides real time labs? You might want to take a look at uh, Great Smokies, uh, or I'm sorry, Great Plains Lab um, does a uh, mole toxin test as well, too. I, I haven't looked at the pricing on it, but I think it is cheaper than the real-time labs. They use a different technique. They're using something called grass, uh, gas, <laughs> grass, gas chromatography uh, as their testing technique. And I think it's a little bit cheaper than what the real-time labs um, is. And I, I think it's, it's fairly accurate uh, from talking with some of my other colleagues in the field, okay? I never used it myself, but from talking with people like Neil Nathan and, and the, or, um, I, I, I believe that's it, it may be a reasonable alternative. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What would you suggest the person living in a molding environment can't move? That, that's a tough one. Um, and your best bet is to get out of there. But if you can't get out of there, you got to, you got, you need to probably get some type of a, a very powerful air filter for your home. Uh, it would have to be something that's like a HEPA air filter, H E P A. Okay. So it might help filter out those toxins. You might need to get a different one in each room, okay? Uh, the other thing would be to try to bind the toxins after they get in you, um, and that is to use binders that do that, okay? So the issue everyone with mold toxin illness is there's around 25% of people that are genetically susceptible to having mold toxin illness, all right? And what happens in mold toxin illness um, is that mold toxins, when we breathe them in, drink them in from the environment, get absorbed into our bloodstream, in 75% of people, our immune system is genetically programmed in a way to identify those mold toxins, tag them to be broken down. They get broken down, they get removed from the body, okay? If you're one of the 25%, though, uh, what happens is those mold toxins don't get correctly I tagged by the immune system because the immune system isn't programmed to see them correctly. Those mold toxins don't get broken down. They go to the liver as a fat-based toxin. And then they go through the liver, the liver tries to detox them, but can't do it. Normally the liver would take a toxin and make it water soluble, water-based. And those water-based toxins would get mixed in our poop and we poop them out. But what happens if you are one of the 25%, those mold toxins go to the liver, they come out of the liver, they don't get absorbed back into the, the um, or they don't get pooped out, they get absorbed back into the bloodstream again because they're fat soluble. And they just stay there and they just keep triggering too many cytokines to be made, okay? So what you could do is try to grab hold of them in the intestines so they don't get reabsorbed again. And what does that are binders. The herbal binders would be activated charcoal uh, and uh, betonite clay can be helpful. Um, I have a whole article in my uh, treat line book on multoxinellus where I talk about binders and how to use them. I can show that to you, but you may want to take a look at that, okay? All right. All right, so let me, so those are some things for you to consider. I, I don't know if they will work for you or not. I mean, the best situation would be to actually uh, probably change your environment if you can, okay? Unfortunately. 
All right, let me uh, just do a quick screen share here. All right, so back in treat line, take a look at the section in my treat line uh, site here, or the, treat, the online guide, and you would want to look under detoxification. And in here, in this article about mold toxin illness, I talk about the various uh, supplements that may help bind toxins in the intestines to pull them out. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for that question, Heather, and good luck to you. Hello, Lisa. Let's see, besides Cemento and Banderol, what is the best herbal protocol for Lyme, Babesi, and Bart if you can no longer do antibiotics? Dr. Rawls, vital plan. What are your thoughts about hyperthermia treatment in Germany? Thanks for all you do. We love you here in New Jersey. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, um, hyperthermia, let's start with that first. Uh, so the idea with hyperthermia is that, excuse me, I think I've got eyebrow that's loose here and it's driving me nuts. Just bear with me a minute here. All right. Um, want to see. Aha. Yeah, let's do this. Okay. I'm going to do a screen share. We're going to look at this question of hyperthermia together by looking at another site. I'm, I'm just looking at my, um, my computer screen here and looking at my bookmarks. I think I have this article ready to be viewed. So let, let me pull it up here just a minute. I'm going to do a screen share and then I'm going to pull that article up. Okay, let's see here. All right. So there, uh, the California Lyme disease, what used to be called the California Lyme Disease Association, which is now called um, uh, LymeDisease.org, has been running a project called My Lyme Data. I'm just bringing my mouse out up here. Basically, anyone can enroll to provide information to this data bank whenever they're asked questions. Okay, so periodically, this data bank called My Lyme Data will send out questions to people that have said, yep, collect information about me, and they'll ask a question, okay? So this one, this, this page here is called What Alternative Treatments Work for Lyme Disease? What are their side effects? Okay. And so what they did is they asked people in their database, uh, did they get any benefit from various alternative treatments? Okay. And let's see here. Hyperthermia, I think. Yeah. Okay. So there, it's interesting. Their study right here, I'm kind of hovering over it showed that around 45% of people thought they got benefit from it. Okay. All right. That's a little higher than I thought it would be. Okay. For instance, their studies, as many of you know, I wrote a recent article about stem cell therapy where I cited them, shows that only 3% of people got benefit from stem cells. All right. Um, but hyperthermia, which means heating up, 45% of people uh, found uh, some benefit from that. Interestingly enough, rife machines were 35%. That kind of reflects when people have had rife machine treatments prior to CME, I usually would find they're saying, I was estimating about 40% would get benefit from it. Uh, this uh, study says that maybe 35% of people do, which is pretty close, okay? Hyperthermia, Mike's, uh, although my Lyme data is saying 45%, my own experience, um, my own experience from people that I have seen that have gone to the clinic in Germany for hyperthermia is that maybe 20% or so got benefit. All right. But I just wanted to show you what my Lyme data is saying on that one. Uh, okay. So anyhow, so it, could it help? Maybe to a degree. I, I, you know, that clinic that's in Germany claims that with superheating like that, that it has the ability to kill Lyme in any form wherever it lives in the body that's a bit of a stretch. Um, I don't think they have any proof that, that people are cured. And even if 45% of people are reporting benefit, I just don't think that those benefits are from what I used to see in my practice. 
Um, and I don't think that they uh, were universally effective either. Okay, so I'll, I'll just share that with you. Okay. Um, so the Rawls vital plan depends on what you're treating. So his vital plan, I think, is could be pretty good for Lyme, the Lyme germ, all right? And that is the herbs that he has selected are very much come from um, uh, Buner. Buner. Buner, as many of you may know, is an herbalist that writes a lot about Lyme uh, antibiotics, okay? So his main uh, antimicrobials that he would use for treating a Lyme uh, would be uh, andrographis and also cat's claw. Those would be the big two. Um, and he also thinks that knotweed, that's part of his protocol, has some antimicrobial effects too. I, I just have never found that knotweed that effective in my practice, okay? So the herbs that uh, Rawls has built into his uh, protocol are ones that support the immune system and also can help um, kill um, Lyme. Rawls is deficient though, when it comes to herbs that actually kill Babesia and kill Bartonella, all right? So one of my complaint, I, I think Rawls is doing a great job. He's, his writings are very useful. I think that uh, his protocol uh, is a lot simpler, for instance, than the protocol I recommend because you only have to take four or five different things. Uh, products that is, but it's too simple for some people, meaning some people need other things you're going to do for Babesia, need other things you're going to do for Bartonella, need other things you're going to do for sleep, need to be on ashwagandha to support the immune system and as an adaptogen, um, need to be on better anti-cytokine agents uh, than he built into his protocol. And so um, I'm not a big proponent of Dr. Rawls' protocol. I think it helps some people but I think for a lot of people, it's missing some of their main germs actually, okay? Um, my opinion besides doing Cemento and Banderol for the Lyme is before going to an andrographis and even the cat's claw that's in Rawls, for instance, you might wanna take a look at a product called Biocidin um, LSF. Biocidin um, has a number of herbs in it that are antimicrobial. And there are some petri dish experiments that suggest that it does a great job of removing Lyme biofilm, also does a good job of killing the Lyme germ. These are petri dish experiments. Clinically, uh, in my practice, before I stopped, I found it as a reasonable second line treatment um, if the uh, Cemento and Banderol Cemento's cat's called Banderol is Otobabark, if those were not working well enough, okay? I would probably find that to be a better alternative than uh, doing um, <laughs> the Rawls Vital Plan, okay? The other thing I would take a look at is the other components that I think should be part of a Lyme disease treatment, and that's to look at my Lyme disease treatment protocol, all right? Um, let me just do a quick screen share here for you. All right, let's go. Oops, <laughs> I, oh, I hope I haven't lost all of you. Um, I went to the wrong place. <laughs> Let me do a screen share if you're still here. Um, there we go, all right. I think, yeah, okay, back here at uh, Treat Lyme. Okay, so in terms of my Lyme disease treatment protocol, look here, okay? I talk about the essential steps you should do in your Lyme treatment. I recently rewrote this and made it into a publishable, downloadable PDF book too. So that's updated as of last week. You can click right there for that, okay? That's free. Uh, but anyhow, it has the essential components and one is get sleep, 
I talk about herbs to do that. Talk about what I think is the best diet when you have Lyme. Talk about things you can do to lower cytokines using curcumin, for instance. Uh, talk about being on an adaptogen like ashwagandha. Talk about fixing hormonal problems. Talk about being a good multivitamin. Talk basically about a supplement you can take for detox. Talk about exercise, uh, immune boosting, getting rid of yeast, what to do to treat Lyme. And then I also talk about what to do for Bartonella and Babesia. Take a look at the Bartonella here. If you're looking at herbal options, I'd like Hutunia and Sidokuda. And take a look at Cryptolepis and Artemisinin for Babesia. I mentioned those here, okay? Again, Rawls does not do enough to help you with Bartonella and Babesia, all right? All right, and then in terms of the alternative to the uh, cat's claw and otoba bark, uh, you might take a look. I have an article on the biocidin. It's right here. Take a look at this and see if this is right for you. Okay, all right. All right. So listen, everyone, that's it for me for tonight. Um, oh, good. I'm glad people are still here. <laughs> Pamela just wrote me. Um, I actually, unfortunately, two things. I lost all your questions when I inadvertently kicked myself off of the webinar there for a minute when I was trying to find my website again. So I've lost my, my uh, webinar program has lost all your questions you wrote. So I don't have any more to answer. But the other thing is, I, I unfortunately needed to, to end the webinar around 7.15 tonight because I have another obligation I need to get to. Um, so I'm gonna I watch tomorrow morning in your emails for me to send information out about uh, setting for the next webinar, which is gonna be a few weeks out again because I have uh, uh, some family issues to take care of. And then, um, and then let's see. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, and then there'll be a link for the webinar too. Uh, boy, that's good. <laughs> I, my mind is slipping here a little bit this evening, but anyhow, uh, so take a look at that for that email. It's come out tomorrow morning, somewhere between probably around 9.30-ish, 9, 9.30-ish, 9, I bet, but maybe a little bit later than that. If you happen not to get it, look for the, the webinar recording on either my Facebook page, or you can look for it on the homepage of treatlime.net, which is the Lyme information site, or you can find it on the homepage of treatlime.com, which is my supplement store. Okay. All right. Uh, take care, everyone. Uh, been good being with you here again tonight. All right. Good night, everyone.